Linda Scott, the Australian Labor Party, Angela Vithulkas from the Small Business Party, Sylvie Ellsmore from the Greens, Shauna Jarrett from the Liberal Party, and Yvonne Weldon from, Yvonne, from Unite for Sydney. The format for tonight's candidate forum will be as follows. Each candidate has been given the same three issues as determined by an online survey, and they've been asked to speak on the issues and add anything else within a time slot of six minutes. The issues that were raised by the community are public housing and housing affordability, climate change, and transport. The other top issues as per the same survey include the sale of public assets, community services, including child, age care and mental health, connected communities, small business, southern employment lands, overdevelopment, waste management, low income residents and unemployment, broken promises and the business vote. Candidates will be given a reminder bell at five minutes and at six minutes will have to stop speaking. This will be strictly enforced. Once all candidates have presented, we will invite you to pose your own questions through the online chat function. Please keep your questions brief. We hope you will understand if we need to cut you short to ensure that as many people as possible get to ask a question before the end of the evening. We also ask that you extend every courtesy to the candidates by hearing them out and treating everyone with respect. The speaking order for tonight was selected by, um, by for the drawing from a hat. The candidate will speak in the following order. Shauna Jarrett, the Liberal candidate. Clover Moore, the Lord Mayor of Sydney. Sylvie Elsmore, the Greens candidate. Yvonne Weldon, who is independent. Angela Vithkultis, sorry, <laughs> keep going. Uh, and finally, Linda Scott, councillor, um, the um, Labour candidate. So just prior to each speaker, I would like to introduce um, the candidates with the following um, bio. So I will do one candidate first, which is Shauna Garrett. And um, then Shauna will have six minutes to speak. So Shauna Garrett is a lawyer and government specialist and is a resident and business owner in Sydney CBD for the past few decades. She is an experienced senior executive and non-executive director within, with a strong professional background in strategic design implementation, specialising in governance across the education, legal and arts community sectors. Shauna has been the chair of the Public Interest, Interest Advocacy Centre, who has established the Homeless P Persons Legal Service, is a trustee of the Australian Museum, and really enjoys uh, uh, learning about our unique cultural heritage and natural history, and is also a director of Force Major, sure. New South Wales leading dance and theatre company. Thank you, Alice, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to participate. And like everyone else, I'd like to acknowledge that I am also on Gadigal country and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and all of those who are emerging. Sydney Liberals believe that all members of a community are entitled to a home, access to education and health systems, the opportunity to have a job, access to sporting, community and artistic spaces, access to the internet and other connection communication methods. And the role of local government is to contribute to the provision of those amenities. The city of Sydney has the widest range of wealthy to poor residents in all New South Wales councils. Therefore, programs to provide social and affordable housing need to be actually implemented, not just a future target that's rolled out when the issues arise. The 2019 City Council's wellbeing indicator set a 2030 target for affordable housing of 7.5% for all Sydney dwellings. That's an estimated 9,500 dwellings. And in the 2020 review, it showed a need for 11,000 dwellings. When the Lord Mayor was elected 17 years ago, the city had 447 affordable dwellings. There are now only 1,028. 
not even one tenth of the 11,000. So council will struggle to meet its 2030 target by even 2040. Council material is often all talk and little action. Sydney Liberals will fight to ensure that low and moderate income households, including many Sydney siders who work in essential services, are actually provided with homes, not promises. Council owns properties that could be renovated to not just provide homes, but also revive the areas where they're located, supporting local businesses, cafes, and community activities. Sydney Liberals will work collaboratively with state government to enable social and affordable housing targets are actually met, not just part of a future movable target. Another part of ensuring Sydney residents and ratepayers live in communities that have a real future, not one on a glossy newsletter, is working with state government policies and plans to ensure all of us can achieve a sustainable world with the balance of jobs and sustainability being worked through. And actually, now that the federal government's come on board, we'll work with them as well to implement real economically sustainable energy and climate plans. By not putting up lights in a local park or allow an outdoor swimming centre to stay open all year because those facilities might detract from council's net zero commitment, that's not the way we should address living sustainably in our city. Staying at home with the air conditioning on, rather enjoying a safe local park or an evening swim is not the way to address climate change. With respect to transport, Sydney Liberals will fight to ensure that sustainable community-based practical solutions are implemented when it comes to, count to transport across the city. The New South Wales Minister for Digital launched an app, Pay and Park, in 2019 and the city of Sydney has yet to participate in the technology, unlike 11 other councils who have taken it up. The app enables people to find real-time parking so you don't drive round and round causing pollution. You can pay and if necessary, top it up from your phone. So if you're late at a doctor's appointment or a school pickup, you don't get fined and the council gets the parking revenue. The app will also enable electrical vehicle public connecting stations and other adaptations to be available to all of us as we use the city. We believe in practical solutions to transport. Not everybody rides a bike, not everybody drives a car, not every street can take a double bus. But by working with state transport services, a citywide plan for sharing our roads should be developed. The city will never be car free because that would disentitle people who need cars, families, people with mobility needs, suppliers and couriers, and people who want to come and enjoy our fabulous city. We could share parking spaces reserved for particular users, like the postal spots that only get used a couple of days a week. Sydney does not need more plans. It needs support to enable all of us to seize the opportunities we need to take recovery from COVID, seriously enable us to rebuild the economy, support and invest in local residents, businesses, arts and community activities. Council should be proactive, listen to what we need, use the hollow logs that council has, currently $126 million in unrestricted cash. Cut down on red tape. You don't need a DA to extend the operating hours of a coffee shop in Martin Place or spend funds on consultants, reports to furnish a mother and child safe place. Sydney needs a refresh, a new approach, not another term of a monopoly. We will bring experience, expertise and diversity along with energy and the liberal values that we have supporting individuals to live, work and enjoy the life they want to have, whilst also providing support to those who need it when they need it. Thanks for listening. If you finish 10 seconds early. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. So we are now moving on to the Lord Mayor of Clovermore, and I'd like to read her bio. So Clovermore is the current Lord Mayor of Sydney, serving her fourth term. She is the first properly elected woman to lead City of Sydney and previously has served on the City and South Sydney Councils. 
Under, under her leadership, the city has developed a global represent, representation, reputation for delivering award-winning facilities, protecting open sp space, promoting design excellence, delivering new transport options, champion sustainability and innovative progressive solutions to complex city social problems. Clover is an arts graduate of Sydney Uni. She has two children, Sophie and Tom. She lives in the inner Sydney Redfern with her husband and their dogs. Um, th thank you, Alice. So hello everyone. Uh, I welcome this opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people, the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of our land and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and acknowledge the people of the many nations who live in our city. It will be difficult to cover social affordable housing, climate change and transport in six minutes. As these have been key priorities at the city under my leadership, but I'll give it a go. I'm gonna start with climate change because that's about the future. And taking action on climate change has been our highest priority, priority since 2007. In 2008, after comprehensive consultation with city communities, we committed to our Sustainable Sydney 2030 strategy and to reduce our operational emissions by 70% by 2030. We did the master plans, we set the targets and we've taken the action and we have met our goal nine years early in 2021. The city of Sydney became carbon neutral in 2007. We were the first Australian city to install energy efficient LED streetlights. We've installed one of the largest rooftop solar programs in Australia, as well as taking many other actions. Last year, we switched to 100% renewable electricity for our operations, which will save our ratepayers half a million dollars every year uh, for 10 years. And we are now collaborating with 24 surrounding councils to support them to bulk purchase renewable electricity. This is really important. Um, that it is really important that we get emissions down right across the metropolitan area. The 70% of emissions are in our cities. We have developed performance standards for net zero energy buildings in partnership with industry and government to also significantly reduce emissions. And we've brought forward our target for citywide net zero emissions to 2035 to be achieved by further expansion of renewable energy, working with our partners, both business and residents, um, to increase the efficiency of buildings, better manage waste, provide active transport and switch to electric vehicles. We've installed Metropolitan Sydney's largest urban water recycling centre in Green Square, which treats up to 900,000 litres of stormwater every day, to provide recycled water for residents and community facilities in the town centre. We have 20 stormwater harvesting systems in our parks, which, which produce 80,000 litres of non-potable water every day to keep our parks and streets green. And we completed Sydney's largest stormwater harvesting system in the Sydney Park, park wetlands. To achieve our goal of increasing canopy by 50% by 2030, we've invested $375 million since 2005 and have now committed a further $377 million over the next 10 years for tree planting, landscaping, and street, streetscape gardening, green roofs, walls, rain gardens, and urban forests. Turning to social housing and social affordability, our policy is a city for all, which includes low-income people and essential workers. Although housing is the responsibility of the state, the city takes action in every way we can. Our affordable housing levies have resulted in 859 completed dwellings, 12% of which are Aboriginal tenancies, since 2015 and with 135 in the pipeline. The current government has now agreed to the city expanding these levies across the LGA, which will enable us to deliver another 1,950 affordable homes by 2036. This is the proposal that the former state Labor government refused to endorse. City West recently received approximately $200 million in levies collected um, from, by the city from developers, and that will deliver 400 homes for, for people in very low, low and moderate incomes in Waterloo, Green Square and Alexandria over the next five years. We've introduced innovative planning controls in the Southern Employment Lands and the Botley Road Precinct to enable affordable housing in areas zoned for mixed business. And we sell land to community housing providers at a discounted rate so they can develop affordable housing which has resulted in 122 homes at Harold Park, Green Square and Redfern with 332 more homes to come. We've established an affordable and diverse housing fund which has issued more than $10 million in grants to support new social and affordable housing projects, resulting in 115 new homes, including Hammond Care in Darlinghurst for homeless people, especially older women, and St George Community Housing in Chippendale for youth at risk, and 160 social affordable homes in Gibbon Street, Redfern, where 43% um, of the homes are for Aboriginal residents. And there are 324 more homes to come. 
Many of you were involved in our campaign to overhaul the state government's Waterloo housing redevelopment plans. The proposal is now down to 3,000 dwellings from 6,800 with just three towers rather than the nine 40 story towers proposed by, by LAC and contains wider streets with more sunlight, provides improved amenity and requires a minimum of 30% social and 20% affordable housing in perpetuity, including 10% for First Nations and 50% market housing. In terms of transport, we work closely with local residents on the Alexandria Local Area Traffic Management Plan, to protect the local streets from West Connects traffic coming off the St Peter's Interchange. Our plan recommended over 20 measures and uh, 17 were approved by Transport for New South Wales. We have built 25 kilometres of separated cycleways and over 60 kilometres of shared paths. <laughs> and cycling has more than doubled since 2017. City partnered with the state's pop-up cycleways as a COVID health measure and uh, we have developed designs for permanent cycleways after community consultation. I support improved connectivity across the railway and agree that North Everly Renewal Project is a great opportunity to do this. I wrote to the Transport Minister asking that the government commit to a pedestrian and cycling connection and that it work with the city, the community and the key stakeholders. I've long lobbied for all roads in our LGA to be 40 k's or less. We've achieved approximately 75% already and this year the Minister for Transport agreed to my proposal to reduce all roads in the city of Sydney to 40 k's. The city contributed $220 million to the light rail project, which has transformed George Street and delivered a new public transport option to the city. We're constructing the critical Green Square to Ashmore Connector Road to connect Alexander and Erskineville to Green Square and our wonderful facilities. Our city is powering and we, we are energised about continuing our work with the city and our community for another term. Are you have a report of strong five, financial six management. Minutes, six minutes. Six minutes. Thank you all. As I said, it was going to be very hard and I gave it a go. Good job, thank you. We didn't have to use the mute button, which is very nice. Okay. Thank you, Clover. Uh, Sylvie um, Elmore, Elmore is the next candidate that is going to be speaking. So Sylvie is a community organiser, lawyer and feminist. She has worked, as, uh, she has worked with organised environmental organisations, uh, unions and Aboriginal groups, coordinating anti-racism, justice campaigns and winning um, winning protections for cultural cultural heritage and native title as a marrickville councillor 2012 to 2016 sylvie worked with the community to deliver new affordable housing the award-winning marrickville library additional and additional bike paths and new public green spaces she has managed community organizations delivered anti-violent programs for the government and advise councils on planning and heritage protection. Sylvie is a founding member of the Redfern Everly Darlington Waterloo Residents Action Group Redwatch, a local, a, a, sorry, a volunteer karate teacher at Jinsi Kool Karate Do and a board member of the Inner Sydney Voice. She is current, she currently works at Sydney University of Sydney, su supporting community research and partnerships in youth mental health. Sylvie. Thank you so much, Alice. I had forgotten that you were going to do the introduction and part of my speech was introducing myself. So it means I don't have to talk as fast. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name's Sylvie Ellsmore. Please let me know if my sound drops in and out. Our internet connection is not amazing here. Um, before I begin, as a matter of protocol and mark of respect, I'd also like to acknowledge that we are, that I'm meeting on Gadigal country in Darlington, Aboriginal country for which sovereignty was never ceded. And I'd like to thank the organisers. There's only a couple of Meet the Candidates this time around, and they're so important. Um, and thank everybody for coming out as well tonight. So I've lived in Sydney all my life. I love this city, but I think we all agree we're facing big challenges. Our city is becoming less equal less affordable, and we're heading towards a climate emergency even faster than we thought possible. The Greens are committed to ensuring that we have not just a sustainable city, but a more equal city, but a brave city, a local council that leads the way and has a loud voice whose actions match the scale of the climate and inequality crises we acknowledge we are facing. I've been in the Greens for 20 years and I've been honoured to represent the Greens and the Newtown community as a local councillor. And the issues that you've identified in your survey are the same ones that we're hearing when we campaign on the streets, um, particularly 
around climate change. The Greens are very proud of the history that we have on the City of Sydney Council. This is the first term that we don't have a Greens councillor, but we're very proud of the history in terms of putting things like climate change on the agenda early and housing affordability, particularly our former Deputy Lord Mayor, Irene Doughty. And of course, I think all the candidates tonight and the city strongly recognise that we are in a growing housing affordability crisis, that the inequality in our cities is driven by that crisis, that that is what is driving the gap between rich and poor in our city. And that council has some solid affordable housing initiatives and, and ambitious targets. Every one of the homes that council has delivered is important, particularly for the people that live in them. But we need to acknowledge that current past plans and what we are planning to do in the future if we stay on the same course has not made a major impact on affordability and it is not likely to. We've had two decades of housing growth, which has delivered less than 1% of affordable housing in the city. We, we keep losing the affordable housing that we have and we've gone backwards. New targets, while ambitious, don't match those that they have in other big cities like New York and London that are talking 20%, 25%, 35%. The Greens are committed to actions that match the scale of the crisis using powers and resources that council has now for housing. We have a costed plan to begin investing, for council to begin investing again, like it used to, directly in building and owning affordable housing. A plan that would radically expand tenant-led, secure affordable housing with rents as low as $100 a week. And our modelling shows that we could save or build 2,000 genuinely affordable homes next council term alone. That's three times more affordable housing than the city has achieved in the last 17 years. We're talking about the council being an investor or owner, helping students and artists establish co-ops that keep affordable housing in the city, supporting Aboriginal community controlled organisations to provide First Nations housing, and as an investor being done in a way that boosts council's bottom line. And please, it's on it, plan is on our website, but if you'd like to DM me, I'll also send the link in the chat. And we need to acknowledge too that we can't address the housing crisis that we have without stopping the sell-off of public housing. This New South Wales government has a mission to sell off or develop the, inner city, the precious inner city housing that we have. It's the selective sell-off of terraces in Glebe. It's the urban renewal plans that will demolish the Waterloo Towers without commitments, without strong commitments to keep the community here. It's plans to redevelop, redevelop successful whole estates like Everly. And council's voice in standing with public housing tenants against this de development needs to be much louder. We are not going to be able to protect the public housing in our city the way the residents and public housing tenants want us to without that stronger voice. Council also needs to be supporting residents to have a seat at the table, responding to government plans from the very beginning. It is not okay for residents to be hearing about changes to plans negotiated with the state government after they've been negotiated and big changes have been made. The Greens are committed to making sure that those people who are affected directly are the ones who are there from the beginning without those meetings behind closed doors. I think tonight all the speakers as well and council has acknowledged we're in a climate emergency and has strong plans. But again, what is important to ask is the climate emergency comes at us faster and harder than any of us had ever even expected is whether those plans are going to make a dent in what we need to given the scale of the emergency. So it's not just about those ambitious targets being met. Some of it's about, thanks Alice, um, making sure that when we do things like tree, tree canopy targets that we can deliver them. But it's also about making sure that we run and control our public services. Outsourcing waste services, which is one of the biggest emissions emitters that the council has, takes away our control. As we've learned during COVID, during crises, we need to be as the public in control of those services if we're gonna be able to deliver the changes that we need and respond to what is this situation. I think I've run out of time to talk about um, transport, but I'm happy to answer questions. But I guess I just wanted to say again that you all know what it means to have Greens representatives represent you locally. You have that in your state and um, in Balmain and Newtown, and you've had Green representatives on the council before. My commitment and the Greens commitment is to push the council to be bolder, to go further, to bring new fresh energy and to work cooperatively with the other councillors for change and to do that in partnership with you, the residents. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Yvonne. Yvonne Weldon is a proud Wiradjuri woman maintaining strong ties to her homelands of Kaura 
and the Riverina areas of New South Wales. Yvonne is passionate for improving the lives of all through health, social justice, Aboriginal rights, children slash youth rights, education, child protection, minimising our carbon footprint, community wellbeing, research and evaluation. Yvonne is Mayor of Sydney. Yvonne is currently elected the Deputy Chairperson for the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, Deputy Chair of the Austral New South Wales Australia Day Council, Board Member of Domestic Violence New South Wales, and of Redfern Jarbon, Jar Jarbon College. Yvonne has held key positions in New South Wales government and Aboriginal community control sectors. Yvonne was awarded the New, the New South Wales 2019 Adult Volunteer for the South Sydney region, Yvonne. Thank you. I'd like to start by acknowledging country that I'm on. I'm on the Gadigal land of the Eora Nation. Pay my respects to all elders past and present and to each and every one of you that have joined us tonight. In December, 1992, at Redfern Park here in the city of Sydney, the then Prime Minister Paul Keating asked Australians to open their hearts a bit. Paul Keating spoke of Aboriginal people having helped build this nation. He spoke of people whose genius and resilience maintained a culture through 60,000 years and more, through devastating changes to the people, climate and the environment. My people also survived two centuries of dispossession and abuse. I am a proud Wiradjuri woman. I'm also a proud resident of Sydney. Because my family and my education at Redfern Public School and St Scholastica's College in Glebe, I've been able to contribute to important work in the areas of youth justice, education, domestic violence and land rights. I am not a career politician. Until I decided to run at this election, I never intended to, to seek public office. I am a political activist and that runs in my blood. My mother helped start the Aboriginal Legal Service, the Aboriginal Children's Service, the Aboriginal Medical Service, the Aboriginal Housing Company, all here in Redfern. She is now an official with the Public Service Association. My great aunt, Colleen Shirley Perry Smith, was a much loved activist and social worker. You might know her better known as Mum Shirl. Sydney has given me opportunities to succeed, but now it has lost its way. This is because the City of City Council is out of touch and out of ideas. In 2008, the Lord Mayor received a report saying that Oxford Street had lost its mojo. 13 years and three council terms later, the situation is much worse on Oxford Street. At a recent forum with residents and stakeholders, Clover Moore outlined her plans to reinvigorate Oxford Street. It was clear nothing new has been advanced by the Lord Mayor. At one point, Clover suggested reducing a speed limit on the main Oxford Street strip to 40 kilometres per hour as one of the solutions. The speed limit on Oxford Street is in fact 40 kilometres for quite some time. Under Clover Moore as Lord Mayor, the City Council has lost connection with those it represents. Recently, the mayors in Western Sydney achieved fantastic results when they rolled up their sleeves and got out amongst the locals to encourage vaccination. By far the worst vaccination rates in the metropolitan Sydney, right up to the present times, are the City of Sydney LGA. It's hard to imagine an issue with greater importance in the city's history than COVID. However, the current Lord Mayor was just missing in action and the vaccination results speak for themselves. Sydney is Australia's most expensive city. The council has not done enough on public and affordable housing. There is a desperate need for direction and targeted policy for homeless in Sydney. I know the importance of spending public funds wisely, and I'm concerned about wasteful spending on vanity projects by the Lord Mayor. I'm also concerned about recent public statements by the Lord Mayor that the city could not afford to host the 9 p.m. fireworks on New Year's Eve. These concerns are why I've called for an audit of council's finances and assets. This is needed for financial probity and to establish whether programs and resources are being efficiently managed. Council has abandoned its cause responsibilities. It has not just outsourced garbage collection, but its responsibility 
too many residents of the City of Sydney have at least one horror story of the garbage not being collected by council, sometimes for several days or weeks. This is a serious risk to public health and it's obvious. If I'm accorded the honour of being elected Lord Mayor, I will sit down with the company that was given the contract for waste management and services and tell them if they do not meet their contractual obligations, serious consequences will follow. Oxford Street is not the only part of the city in decline. For some years, Sydney has been overtaken by both Brisbane and Melbourne in terms of quality of inner city life, transport, services, entertainment, shops, restaurants, service businesses have either closed or relocated to the CBD. As Lord Mayor, I will appoint the best available team to address what may, many regard as the death of the City of Sydney. Effective policy is not necessarily expensive. Recently, I announced the urban billabongs, which will allow residents and visitors to immerse themselves at one of the five shallow billabongs to be installed in recreational spaces around Sydney. In relation to climate policy, the city is far too dependent on gas. Gas may be a transition fuel, but it is not green. Even the new 100 million plus Ganyama Aquatic Centre is powered by gas. Transport is foremost an issue for the state government. However, the council can do a lot more if it, than it currently does as an advocate for residents with poor public transport access. I would establish a hotline so that people with transport problems could suggest and bring to council's attention their needs. I fully support cycleways that are safe to use. The City of Sydney have failed to deliver cycling initiatives. Over the past two years, Council of Transport, Council and Transport of New South Wales have imposed unsafe cycleways in Glebe and other locations without proper safety audits being undertaken and without community consultation. The council's actions have created unacceptable dangers for cyclists and totally ignore the serious impact for residents by removal of parking and access to residential and business premises. I want to acknowledge being a part of history in this election for the Lord Mayor where each of the six candidates is a woman. There is much more to be done and many serious problems in this LGA. I look forward to continuing to work with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. The next um, candidate is Councillor Angela Bertogas. Angela is a multi-award winning business owner who has forged a successful career in public business and corporate life. Angela was first elected to the City of Sydney Council in 2012 then in 2016 and is seeking a third term now in 2021. In 2015, she was also named one of the Aust Australian's 50 influential women entrepreneurs. And in 2017, she was named as one of Australia's top nine influential female entrepreneurs. In 2018, again, amongst enormous, Stumbling with odds, Angela formed the Small Business Party, an independent political party, which aims to provide a robust and honest representation for small business communities and residents in Australia. Angela. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on the land which we all find ourselves this evening uh, and to pay my respects to both elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to thank the event organizers this evening. This is a monumentous task, technology notwithstanding. Uh, everybody coming from all different angles and we've all seen the comments in the chat. I can't hear you, I can hear you, my internet's no good. Why are we saying that question? It gets more entertaining as it gets on. Um, I'd also like to uh, break the mold a little bit here and say that um, Congratulations to all the candidates that are here, uh, my fellow councillors, the Lord Mayor for the nine years that I've been able to share a chamber, uh, to Councillor Scott, thank you very much for your hard work in the community, and to the new candidates, um, whichever way this all goes, I think everybody will has heard this evening that there are six very capable women here and lots of choice on the ballot paper. And congratulations to all of us because running in any election off the back of COVID is indeed one of the struggles that we've all had to face. So we are all in this together at the moment, so thank you. We've been given three topics um, to address briefly within our six minutes and to also include some of our other uh, platforms that we might be running on. I think what I'd like to highlight is that I've spent nine years in council. 
uh, meant to be an eight year term, of course, we've had that small extension because of COVID. It's been for me a very interesting nine years. I don't have a political background, very new to everything from 2012, just entering the political arena uh, off the back of, of saying that small business didn't have a voice. At that stage, I'd been a business owner myself in the city of Sydney for 25 years. And I was surprised at how little I knew uh, how government worked, the, the impacts that it could have on the individual, and in fact, the strength of local government. I had very little knowledge of local government. I would like to say that today, um, I believe that there are superfluous levels of government, state might be one of them, and that uh, local government is one of those areas that can improve people's lives at a grassroots level, that has so much more to offer our community and plays such an enormous part in making change. Please don't discount your local government and don't discount your local councillors and the impacts that they can have and the advocacy and the roles that they need to play in your lives. The lives of the community, your families, and of course, small business owners. When we look at the three, uh, the three topics that were put before us, which was public housing, housing affordability, climate change, and of course, transport, it is indeed very difficult to cover any of those items um, within this short time frame. What I'd like to say is that my nine years of council have opened my eyes on the struggles that we are facing, the climate emergency that has emerged, the little few tools and resources that local government actually has to make that difference. And of course, public housing and housing affordability is a huge, huge trigger for all of us because we feel it locally. We can see the inequity. We can see who has and who hasn't. And that not a lot, the reality is not a lot is being done at the government levels where it should be addressed. I'm very proud of the work that I've done for nine years in council. I'm very proud of a lot of the, um, the policies, the resolutions, the projects that we've supported. In fact, I'm sure that um, statistically, uh, councillors have supported most projects almost 98% of the time. So there's a wonderful consensus to really make public housing, housing affordability, climate change and transport key matters of council. You've heard the Lord Mayor uh, bring forward emissions targets, strategies, what we've achieved, what the plans are moving forward. I would only add that these decisions aren't made in isolation. There are 10 councillors that contribute to council and the decisions. There are amazing staff behind a lot of these projects and the strategies that they bring forward. And it does take 10 councillors to come together and make this happen. There is a great cohesion on council. The areas I think that we fall short is understanding sometimes perhaps how our big projects don't quite cover off, cover off enough locally and how they don't uh, address perhaps the needs immediately. Waste is a big one um, for us. Uh, waste is going to be, I think, the greatest, one of the greatest challenges that's going to face local government. We've been, uh, and pardon the pun, this has been dumped on us, if you will, without resources from state and federal government enough to address it. We're dwelling in an area that will see change in the community moving forward. I'm, I'm sure you've all heard of the great number of bins that are about to descend on, on all of our residents and how we're going to have to work through all of that. Thank you. Uh, I'd, um, in the essence of time and, and, and moving forward, I would like to say that I think moving forward, why I've decided to run for a third term off the back of probably my initial decision to retire is that I think that the, the operations of government, the way local government works needs to seriously be addressed. We come up with the great ideas. We even have the patience to deliver some of those great projects. What we forget is that our local communities need us a lot more on an everyday basis, on everyday matters that, in, that impact them. I believe one of the greatest challenges that we've neglected is allowing our community to present and meet with us on a regular basis and have what I would call questions without notice sessions that I think the community would benefit from, from meeting their counsellors face-to-face, looking at us in the eye, calling us out on what we don't do and calling us out on what we should be doing. And of course, we need much more community connection. We need a greater liaison unit that can really get out there in the community and listen to you and bring to us what we need to change. Thank you, Vanessa. Vanessa. So our final but not least is um, Councillor Linda Scott. Linda Scott has served as the Labor Councillor on the Council since 2012 including time as Deputy Lord Mayor. 
She has successfully advocated for an increased city action on climate change and doubling library funding, new affordable housing and increased support for those experiencing homelessness. She has successfully advocated for new childcare, skate ramps and spearheaded action, uh, city action to fight racism and support refugees. She has, she has set the national agenda as the president of the Australian Local Government Association and is the first woman to be elected as the president of the Local Government New South Wales, the peak body for New South Wales councils. A strong supporter for reforming the Australian Labor Party, Linda won Labor's first ever community priest selection in 2012 as Labor's candidate for Lord Mayor of Sydney in 2012. Linda is also the deputy chair of Labor's Sustainable, Sustainable Communities Committee. Linda lives with her husband and two children in Newtown, Sydney. She enjoys bushwalking, swimming and live music. Thanks so much, Alice. And I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that uh, many of us tonight, and certainly I am on Gadigal land, I pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and thank them for their continuing custodianship of the land that we all have the privilege of living and working on. I'd also like to thank Vanessa, Andrew, and the many, many others who have worked so hard uh, between Friends of Erskineville, Red Watch and ARAG to put together this forum uh, and all of you who continue to work as part of those community groups to advocate constantly for a better future for the City of Sydney. I've had the privilege of working with so many of you over my uh, nine years on council and I know how much uh, effort and hard work you all put in, so thanks so much. Uh, as uh, Alice said, I first ran uh, and was elected to the city nine years ago when my son uh, was born and we were searching for access to some affordable childcare in Erskineville. Uh, as I sort of went round all the childcare centres here in South Sydney uh, and saw that the waiting lists were 600 long, I was very motivated to uh, run for the city of Sydney. And so as you hear my nine-year-old uh, and 11-year-old running around in the background, uh, you'll be pleased to hear that having been elected to the council, it was great to see that we have been able to deliver a range of new early education and care centres. But more broadly, together, as you've heard the Lord Mayor outline over the last 10 years, we've achieved so much together as a group. And I also acknowledge my fellow councillors, many of whom I know are on the line tonight, Lord Mayoral candidates and otherwise. Uh, and we've also got a range of Labor um, candidates on the line, Freya Bentley, Damien Minton, I think Auntie Norma Ingram, and perhaps some others whom I've missed. To the key topics, the recent research that's been published by Demographia International has noted that Sydney is the third least affordable city across the globe followed only by Vancouver and Hong Kong for its unaffordability. It was really disappointing, uh, although not new, to hear the Lord Mayor speak tonight about her view that housing is the responsibility of the New South Wales government. And I want to draw a very clear line in the sand. That is not the view of Labor. We take the view that the responsibility for uh, the provision of adequate affordable housing is the responsibility of all three levels of government in Australia and that the City of Sydney has a really important role to play in ensuring that there is access to affordable housing. Uh, over my nine years on council, I've moved more than 30 motions on this issue to try to increase city funding and action. And for a council that has just recently ended our financial year with a surplus of more than $195 million, I'm really confident that we can together deliver more of that towards the provision of affordable housing. During the COVID pandemic, I and others worked with the state government and community organisations and councils across the state to see more than three and a half thousand people experiencing homelessness housed in a week. They were housed in a week. 
So we know that solutions to the problem of housing affordability and homelessness are possible when there is the right political intent, when there is the right motivation with leaders who are committed to acting. Uh, I am very proud with our Labor team to announce our Labor plan for uh, more action on affordable housing. Um, I'm very happy to circulate the details, but in short, we want to ensure pensioners in the City of Sydney get free rates. We want to ensure the city continues to fund staff to support those experiencing homelessness and continues to conduct the biannual rough sleepers count to form a data set to learn from and to have targets to reduce. We want to commit to ensuring there's at least one further common ground facility. For those of you who are familiar with the existing facility in Camperdown, this was funded uh, in part by Tanya Plibersek, the, of course, Labor federal member when she was the federal housing minister in the Rudd government. And we know that with the numbers of people sleeping rough in our city currently, just one more Num one more dwelling a block of apartments would essentially house all those sleeping rough currently in our city of Sydney. Labor is committed to investing a further $10 million into the city's diverse and affordable housing fund, something unfortunately that other councillors around the table have previously voted against and fighting to ensure that we expand the use of voluntary planning agreements and expand the use of our affordable housing developer contribution scheme across the scope of the city so that there is more funding to support the creation of new affordable housing. Uh, as a councillor, I've worked so hard with public housing tenants to support their advocacy in light of sell-offs and very difficult circumstances where we see redevelopments from the Liberal government and their dreadful agenda to continuously sell off more and more public housing in the city of Sydney. And to this, I wanna call out my good friend, Mara Demetrio, who passed away recently uh, and pay my respects to her. So we've got a very strong vision on affordable housing. On climate change, the City of Sydney Labor team, thanks Alice, has the strongest emissions reduction plan um, with targets for net zero emissions by 2030. No worries. Okay. Thank you all um, for your time. Now, uh, we've got a number of questions that have been put in the chat, um, and so I'm going to just go through them. Uh, in order. Um, we are conscious of time because it's now 10 to 8. Um, we will um, try and get as many on by, perhaps we might go a little bit after 8, but not much farther because I know that um, people have homes to go to, etc. So uh, the first question comes from Grant Donahue. Um, and um, it's the question is, will, and it's a question to all of the candidates, so perhaps you would all um, answer um, quickly. But the question is, um, which, what is the councillor's view on allowing nuclear subs in Sydney? So perhaps if I can go in order, um, Linda, so we don't have a fun fight. Grant, I'm not sure um, that's within the domain in any way of local government, but broadly, I've been a very strong opponent of nuclear power my whole life, if that gives you any indication. Uh, I grew up under the wing of Tom Uren uh, and learnt all my lessons about life from him. So that's my view on that. Could we go to the next candidate, the one before? Councillor Angela, were you before? Oh, sorry. Yes, Angela, would you like to respond to that question? Yes, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm not aware of the nuclear subs uh, in Sydney Harbour. I would be horrified by them coming in. So, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I'm, I wait with great interest to find out how that's going. Um, I think uh, nuclear is a very uh, interesting subject. I don't think it's the purview of local government to comment on submarines, but um, it will be interesting to hear what the public thinks of that. Are, are, are they ours? To, to any nuclear subs anyway. Can we move to, El, uh, to Sylvie perhaps? Yeah, so people would know the Greens have had a long history of being at the forefront against um, nuclears and 
like a lot of issues, we think local council is the place to address the issue that local residents care about. It's why there were no new signs appointed by um, around the inner west, for example, by the Greens um, controlling that council. Some of this is about what councils can do supporting residents. And part of that is about supporting activism. So I think one of the things that we're missing at the moment is that activist voice on council and to talk about council needs to be creative in responding to way, the things that residents care about and a response that says, oh, sorry, that's not our level of government is not what residents expect. So I would support activists to, so obviously would have resist um, those sorts of things in our city, but to support activists in their campaigns Thanks. to do that. Thanks, Sylvie. Clover, if I could move to you. Clover, you're still on mute. I'm sorry. Yourself. So I, I, I also have a history of opposing nuclear vessels coming into Sydney Harbour, when, uh, particularly when I was a, an MP. Um, and I think I would strongly reject the statement that the city of Sydney is missing activist, activist voices. Um, we have a very strong active voice um, and we take, uh, take issues to state and federal governments on behalf of our communities um, whenever we, we are, are asked to do. Thank you, Clover. Um, Yvonne, if I could ask you to speak next. Oh, look, you know, um, gas, as I raised earlier, is always is dangerous and expensive and isn't green. I certainly wouldn't be encouraging nuclear uh, submarines and power to be entering our city, so I certainly would oppose it. Okay, Shauna. I think as met, some of the council people have already suggested it's it's actually a federal government issue and people have the right to vote at, and be activists at the appropriate level to express their opinion um, as to what's happening in their country, their city or their local council area. Thank you. The next question comes from um, a number of people, Damien Minton, Paul Davies and Jane. Um, and this question is for Shauna. Uh, Shauna, did, the, did you as a candidate support the sale of the Millers Point public housing and the proposal for the Waterloo development? Well, I wasn't a candidate. This is my first time as a candidate and being involved in, um, in politics. So um, no, I wasn't a candidate at the time. I do know that as a walk around the city, I saw the conditions that people were asked to live in in those Miller Points apartments. And by the sale of them, those people were all able to be housed in far more appropriate um, um, housing. So no, I wasn't a candidate at the time of that decision. Okay. Uh, the next question uh, is for uh, Clover Moore. Um, why is the council upgrading perfectly good bus shelters, public toilets, kiosks and billboards um, and uh, why is most of this furniture going to landfill? Keep putting me on mute. <laughs> um, we had a 20-year contract with JC Deco and we have just renewed that contract, um, not with JC Deco, but with, with another contractor. And as part of that contract, the, uh, the street furniture is being um, replaced. Um, and that will then last for another 20 years. And I have certainly requested that um, uh, the JC Deco, the seats particularly run by um, Philip Cox, um, be, uh, be recycled. Respect poor Alice and Vanessa have popped off. Have we got you there, Andrew? Um, Can yeah. everyone hear okay, us? They're We're back. Still Tons of running Zoom. Sorry about that.
um, Virgil Wilson has disclosed that he is it's breaking up a bit, Janessa. Uh, you just muted yourself. Did you hear the question? No, but they didn't hear the question. No. Beg your pardon. The question is about uh, the restrictions being placed on people who are conscientious vaccine dissenters um, and uh, what people, you know, what each of the candidates think about creating this the vaccinated and the unvaccinated cohorts in Sydney. Do you want me to give you this one? Did everybody hear that? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Oh, God. Mute that one. Yeah. Oh, yes. I heard that, Vanessa. Um, I think it's probably a question for everybody. Um, I think, uh, can we uh, answer that question in the us. order, the original order of the, uh, of the candidates? Sorry. Um, um, Okay, go ahead, Vanessa. Bear with me a minute. We have, we're just swapping around laptops. <laughs> Sorry. The, the, I'll repeat. Did everyone hear the question eventually? No. All right. The question was, um, it's about restrictions on unvaccinated people. Where do the candidates stand on treating conscientious vaccine dissenters as second-class citizens? Um, and the gentleman who's asked has, has received both doses of Pfizer, but believes people should have the ability to make their own decisions about vaccine without um, any kind of sanctions. So if I can ask um, Linda perhaps to respond first. Sure. Um, look, the New South Wales health orders are going to very soon allow the same rights for people who are vaccinated and are not vaccinated. So, I mean, this is going to be what the council will need to abide by under uh, state health orders. Uh, I do want to call out, though, that, um, and I understand people have, um, in some very limited cases, medical reasons, very legitimate medical reasons why they can't be vaccinated. But um, as a person with a sister with a disability who's fully vaccinated, but whose health and life is at risk from people who choose not to be vaccinated if she captures COVID. Um, I have to be very frank, I have very strong views about the importance of community members accessing vaccination. Uh, I worked very hard with those 12 mayors in the local government areas of concern during this last year to ensure their communities had access to uh, enough vaccinations uh, in light of the outbreaks. And I would um, drive more action here at the City of Sydney. Um, this is, and we need to be frank about this, not just a um, decision about one's individual health, because of course it impacts uh, the community's health as well. Space bar. Okay, thank you. Could I ask Sylvie just to respond? Could I ask each of you to keep your responses really brief? Um, yeah, just absolutely. Look, the Greens support the public health orders and the public health response, um, and it is. I, yeah, I find I'm challenged by some of the language around segregation um, in relation to this. I agree with the comments that Linda's made, but I also think we need to call out when there's hypocrisy and inconsistency with those orders the allowing of the major horse racing and competitive events um, that were about getting huge crowds of people together that were not about our public health and put people in the city at risk. I think it's really important that while we support public health orders, we also call out when somehow they can be turned off for certain capitalist and uh, big donor needs by the state government and there hasn't been enough of that. Yep. Thank you. If I could ask Clover to... Yes, um, the City of Sydney has, has closely followed the, uh, the state health orders um, and I strongly believe that everyone has a responsibility to get vaccinated, um, not only for their own safety, but for the safety of the community. Um, and I, I want to also add, because of misinformation by the previous speaker, that um, the City played a key role in um, 
ensuring that our, our community had opportunity to be vaccinated, particularly our social housings, particularly uh, our First Nations people. Um, and we made our community facilities available. In fact, they're, they're still, uh, some of them are still available. Um, and I think the, um, the, 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 the fact that um, the city of Sydney continued to appear as, as a, an area that was low on vaccination, um, I think was to do with the fact that the, the government was using the, the census from the 2016 census um, figures uh, and, and then comparing them with the numbers of people who are living in the city. Uh, in those areas around um, Chippendale particularly, um, where all of our students were living when the census occurred in 2016. They're no longer there, they're, they're not there now. We think that's one of the reasons why it was low. But um, since our young people have been, and we have a you know, predominantly a young community have been able to um, be vaccinated, our numbers have dramatically increased. And I'm really pleased to see that. But we have worked very closely with, with state, um, with, with Sydney Health to ensure that we um, could open up all our community facilities to make sure everyone had an opportunity to be vaccinated because we think it's really, really important. Thank you, Clover. Um, Yvonne, if I could ask you to go next and just unmute yourself. Hello, yes. Um, look, my team actually pulled resources and we had no resources to say the least, but we're with uh, Reverend Bill Cruz and Kylie Kwong and made accessibility for people that are already isolated. Off Pitt Street here in Redfern, there are two elderly residents that died only in the last week about their, uh, because they are vulnerable. Vulnerable and isolated in their own homes because of these vaccination opportunities have not been done and have not been handled well. We need to think about those that are vulnerable. We need to think about our hospital workers. And I believe that vaccination rates and, and the opportunities to be vaccinated needs to be available. And we also need to make sure that those that can be vaccinated should be. And so the information and also the port supports that we need to put in place need to be made available. And I think local government plays a key part of that, but we need to be able to do it with the people and for the people. Thanks, Yvonne. I'll go to um, Angela next. And I have been asked if I can mix up the speaking order the next time around if we have a question, so I will do that. Angela, if you could respond. Thank you. Uh, one of the greatest issues, I think, around these uh, health orders has been the incredible challenge of the, the hypocrisy of it, uh, where they've applied, where they haven't applied, where they're so supposedly mandated, where they aren't mandated, um, that massive gatherings... Uh, that suit sport events are okay, but students sitting in their HSC or, or doing anything else, it, 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 for me, it, it boggles the mind. I am double vaccinated, so is my family, but I would like to say that I think it is incredibly important that people do have choice and that they aren't segregated or victimised or ridiculed for having a view. I have several friends who are pregnant and they are at this moment having to carefully consider what they do moving forward. And I'm grateful that I don't have to make that kind of decision, but I would like to say that I'd like to respect people when they do have some concerns and I don't have a blanket answer on, on that particular issue. I think it's we should keep each other safe. We should do our best. We should respect the health orders, but I would like to have seen them consistent all the way across to everybody. Thank you, Angela. Shauna, if I could ask. Um, a bit like Linda, I have a family member who a long time ago was in, affected by an infectious disease. Um, health orders are there to keep everybody in the community safe. And I think one of the things we've learnt from this pandemic is how all levels of government need to work together to ensure that we're all kept safe. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to mix this up a bit. The next question comes from Jeff Turnbull. And the question is to all candidates, um, whether or not um, you all support public housing. Uh, probably best if I ask for a yes, no answer in this regard, if you don't mind. And I'm going to go to Sylvie first. Yes, strongly. Thank you, Jeff. Linda? Very strong, yes. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Shauna. Sorry, yes, very strongly. With uh, fiscal responsibility around it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Angela. 
Uh, yes, with no disclaimers. Uh, Yvonne? Yes, certainly uh, social and affordable housing or public housing, but not making sure that our money doesn't doesn't sit in the bank, that it actually we provide that housing that's so desperately needed. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, Clover? Uh, Clover, you're still on mute. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Okay, next question uh, is from Sarah Nolan. Um, the question is, can wards be reinstated so that residents have, a key, so have key contacts or counsellors who have a knowledge of their ward therefore avoiding trying to reach the right person at council for any issues. So I'm going to ask uh, Angela first, your views on wards. And again, if I could ask everyone just to have a very brief answer. I never used to believe that there should be wards reintroduced. Uh, my nine years on council have started to, to make me see that that is a possibility given what the community is currently talking about. Um, that they do struggle to reach out and connect. It's one of those reasons why I think we have to have a monthly questions without notice and community connection to people where they should be able to turn up, speak directly to counsellors, uh, voice their questions and concerns directly and not have to wait and see who's going to answer an email, who might answer the phone, lobbying the right group, currying favour with different counsellors. It should never be about the politician. It should be about the citizens and the residents and what they need to change not who's a politician at that time. Clover, if I could ask you next, please. Yes, I, I support the, um, the existing setup because not only do uh, the city councillors um, represent local, the local villages, they also represent the global city of Australia. Um, the uh, economic activity of the Sydney CBD is worth a quarter of the state's economic activity, 7% um, of the national economy, and I think it's really important that we all, um, uh, that we don't have a, a ward councillor representing the global city. We should all be representing the global city. And I also believe we should all be representing the villages. We should all have a concern about all of the areas in the city. We did do cons consultation on this some years ago and um, the, the current situation was uh, what was supported by the majority of residents. Thank you. Uh, Sylvie, your views on wards. Thank you. Um, well, I was a ward councillor and married for council, and certainly there are some strong merits to being able to both have someone who knows your local area really well and is accountable for that, and then you make decisions as a collective about the things that affect everybody. The Greens' position is that it is something for the local community to decide, um, and if there's a move to have that question re-examined, then that should be the council should be open to that. But to, to reflect some things that Angela said, actually we hear a lot of feedback too that um, the city feels a lot more distance than it used to be and this was before the pandemic as well there needs to be a lot more done to connect people so that they're being heard not just to the councillors but to the staff so they're not dealing with consultants when they're talking about issues they're dealing with people that the, remember the last three times they got asked about what was really important in their local area it's not just about the elected councillors it's about a strong and secure public service that connects with people there's some amazing people at the city but um, that is feedback that we get about something that has changed in recent years from the way the council used to work. Thank you, Sylvie. Uh, Shauna, if I could ask you to respond. Um, I actually agree with, with what Sylvie is saying, and it's about access to councillors. I'm talking to many community groups, and once upon a time, councillors came out and attended community meetings. Um, it's not done anymore. I've, when or if I'm elected, I will be attending community groups to listen. And then also having access to council staff to actually, I worked to the council once for a while and there was no access to individual council staff members to help work through the issue that our um, voters sent in. And if the matter was resolved in favour of the city, then it was advertised. If it wasn't, the um, ratepayer never heard back from anybody. I think it's more about the council being and councillors being available to Thank you, residents and ratepayers. If I could pass to Yvonne. Oh, look, I certainly think, you know, we need to put local back locally. And so I do believe it needs to be explored. I also believe that the tenure of the Lord Mayor should be looked at as well. I think that should be explored. Thank you. And last but not least, Linda. 
Thanks. I moved a motion in 2015 before the last local government elections to initiate the process to introduce wards in the city of Sydney. Uh, it was voted down by a majority. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't exactly remember, but you know, it was not a majority of the council that um, supported it. Um, City of Sydney Labor's had a very long standing and very strong support as we did when the um, um, South Sydney Council um, used to operate to have wards uh, and to put that question to the community to ensure that they can have a choice about the um, introduction of them. I was very disappointed that my motion didn't get up. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, Tim, I'm having trouble with the technology at this end too. Look, it's it's a little bit after 12 past eight. I'm actually going to um, to call a stop to um, this tonight. Um, I'd like to thank um, all of our candidates tonight for making their time available. Um, despite some of our difficulties and despite having to put restrictions on, on how we've managed this and we've had all sorts of technology issues here, I think, I think I'm onto my third laptop tonight. So... Uh, just for fun, um, but I really, um, you know, I love the fact that as a community we get involved and we ask questions. Um, what we might do is that uh, we will provide um, all of the candidates with the list of questions and they can perhaps um, put their positions out on social media or however they want to respond. Um, we are, um, as I said, less than a month out from this election and like every election, I think it's critical that we all have a say. Um, I do encourage everybody to think about what they've heard tonight and to make their vote based on, um, you know, the real interaction with the candidates, despite the fact that it's in this fairly unreal environment. And I, I for one, look forward to the time when we can actually all get together. So can I thank each of you individually uh, and on behalf of all the residents for making the time and to the residents that have taken part and have uh, really made an effort to um, put forward some very good questions and I think we've got a better sense of our candidates so I'd like to wish you all a very good night um, and to all our candidates the best of luck at the at the ballot paper and as I said a very much a grateful thank you from all of us. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you to you Vanessa and, you. Alice and, uh, and all, everyone for coming. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you everyone.